Hello and uh, welcome back. We will start with module 4 today. Uh, this module deals with the bilingual brain as in uh, the relationship of having learned two languages at least more than one language that is. So, if there is any distinct difference between a monolingual brain versus a bilingual brain. So, that is the primary motivating factor. Now, even when understanding, trying to understand the bilingual brain as in how a bilingual uh, bilingual's brain functions in terms of language learning, in terms of language processing and many other factors. Initially, this field also was motivated by the monolingual brain as the standard, as the default uh, uh, thing to be noted. So, uh, as we have seen in the beginning in the first, uh, second, first and second modules that a lot of research in bilingualism, bilingual uh, language acquisition, bilingual language processing and all of that related area have been motivated primarily in the initial stages, primarily the motivation was to look at how a bilingual is different from a monolingual. That was how uh, the study started and the same happened with bilingual uh, understanding, trying to understand bilingual brain as well. So, um, this domain also was uh, based on the presumption that typical language user is a monolingual. Right? So, that is uh, however not anymore the case and we now know that bilingual is a distinct kind of a language user and hence this is a domain of interest for its own sake rather than comparing and contrasting it with the monolinguals. So, as a result of which we have already seen 1960s onwards uh, a lot of research has uh, taken place in the field of bilingualism. And the more the studies, the more the findings, the more also has been the controversy. So, there is a lot of uh, this uh, agreement and lots of controversies in this domain. However, this is a very important domain of research within bilingualism as of today. Now, the main questions, the dominant questions that have been that have been looked at in this domain are whether there are distinct neural correlates of multiple languages. Let me unpack this a little bit for you before we go into the details. What does distinct neural correlate mean? This means that every language probably or that is the, exactly the question, do, does mul do multiple languages have distinct brain regions responsible for processing that particular language? So, is there a neural signature of one or two or three languages in the human brain. So, does it basically mean that uh, a monolingual's brain uh, behaves differently compared to a bilingual's brain compared to a trilingual or a multilingual's brain? So, are there distinct neural uh, correlates for different languages? That is the first one. And also another important question that has been um, uh, asked is that whether the learning of the second language use different brain regions. Do we learn our first language and second language using the same brain regions or are there different regions? So, as we see that two primary questions uh, with respect to bilingual brain have been the learning of second language and uh, using of second language. So, these are the two areas where we are uh, trying to figure out the neural correlates. Now, keeping that in mind, we have um, uh, more often than not these are the primary areas. There are some other uh, related areas as well, but these are the primary areas when we look at uh, bilingual brain. The first thing is the study of laterality, laterality as in where in the brain a particular function is located. This is, uh, this sounds simpler than it actually is as we will shortly see. Similarly, the allocation of cognitive resources. Allocation of cognitive resources has to do with what kind, how much of neural uh, energy or let us say how, what all kinds of cognitive apparatus, faculties like attention, executive control are necessary for L1 versus L2. How, uh, in other words, how much dependence does one's uh, uh, first language versus second language have on different kinds of cognitive resources. So, that is another interesting domain within this uh, broad area. And also language disorder has been a very important uh, domain to study in this regard. So, we will see them one by one starting with laterality. Now, before we go into laterality with respect to bilingualism, let us understand what is laterality. 
to start with. So, the uh, first and foremost let us look at what is cerebral laterality. Cerebral laterality uh, is nothing but looking at the two hemispheres and it in terms of the functions that they are uh, known to serve. So, first thing first the brain as all of us know is uh, divided into two main hemispheres the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. But unlike many other paired organs in the human body like uh, uh, many other uh, uh, paired bodies, paired uh, organs like kidneys and stuff and the, and the lungs and so on, human and the two hemispheres are not exactly a mirror image of each other. The two hemispheres are different and distinct in many ways. Okay. So, uh, primary difference among them is the functional difference, the uh, what is stored in which part of the brain. So, the, but nonetheless the two hemisphere all constantly talk to each other, they are, they are always uh, cooperating for carrying out most of the functions that we are, that we know. So, they exchange information through a set of axons which is called the corpus callosum. So, that is uh, corpus callosum is from, is the, is where, uh, is what connects both the brains, uh, both the parts of the brains, okay. So, um, but otherwise the, these are two distinct hemispheres. So, damage to the corpus callosum interferes with the exchange of information as you would. This is like a highway. So, there are two uh, dif distinct uh, parts of the brain and this highway connects one to other and if in case there is some kind of damage that happens either uh, through some kind of accident or through surgical uh, processes, then there is a lack of communication between these two hemispheres. And in most uh, humans, left hemisphere specializes in language. So, that is the very fundamental understanding as far as cerebral laterality is concerned. Now, let us look at a little bit uh, more in detail. So, lateralization can also be thought of uh, in some sort of a division of labor. So, how each segment in the brain, how each segment in the each of the hemispheres of the brain are, are, are divided into in terms of the functions or cognitive processes as we will uh, call them. And this is what is technically called the cerebral laterality. So, which part of the brain is responsible for housing what kind of um, uh, function. Now, what before we get into uh, further uh, uh, discussion, one important thing about brain needs to be uh, kept, in, kept in mind that is the contralateral control. So, left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right part of the brain controls the left side of the body. This is one of the fundamental things to keep in mind whenever we study brain and its um, uh, functions with respect to whether language or any other functions. So, contralateral control mechanism is something that is a fundamental thing. Now, the basic function of the left hemisphere includes language, we have already uh, said that and calculations while the right hemisphere is used for visuospatial cognition. So, this is a uh, sort of simplistic map for you to look at uh, the de dependent on the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere, you can see a list of a rough broad list of functions that are uh, how, how they are lateralized, right. So, this is how it is. So, in terms of cerebral laterality, we already know that the left hemisphere as far as language is concerned, left hemisphere ha is the seat of language. In fact, uh, it is so much so that it is said that we speak with our left hemisphere, right. Now, let's, uh, next is behavioral laterality. Behavioral laterality as in when uh, what kind of what which part of the brain is responsible when any kind of behavioral output is to be given. So, various kinds of tasks have been uh, used to find out the uh, types of. So, how do we come to the cerebral laterality is through behavioral laterality. We be, by giving various kinds of tasks to the human brain and seeing which part of the brain gets activated and how which are the uh, neuronal networks that fire together is how we know where these functions are located. Right? So, these studies go back a little uh, back in time. So, one of the first to study this was Mark Dax in 1865. Uh, quite a long time back, he had observed for the first time that a person with injury to the left hemisphere could not speak. So, this uh, there are many studies by Mark Dax, but unfortunately, he did not publish most of them. Uh, but he was the first person to mark that, that injury to left hemisphere has a result in uh, language impairment. 
Later Paul Broca extended this line of work and today uh, if we say that we speak with left hemisphere it is credited mostly to Paul Broca because, uh, because of his uh, work on the on aphasia. So, now, now the most extensive body of research on language and brain basically comes from behavioral laterality measures. So, we will discuss various measures like this one by one. Some of these studies are called right visual field advantage, right ear advantage and so on. So, in case of both um, auditory and visual processing, it has been studied on, on uh, as it has been studied on monolinguals, we already know that that monolinguals show a right ear and visual advantage. What it means is that um, right ear advantage is typically observed for verbal stimuli, meaning the stimuli given to right ear will be uh, processed better or faster or more accurately. Right? The, so, verbal judgments are made faster when the stimuli is left to the left hemisphere. So, as we said, the left hemisphere controls everything that happens in the right side of the body. And, and vice versa. So, any input coming from the right side of the uh, of your sensory organs like eyes and ears are processed in the left hemisphere and that is what we are talking about here. So, anything that is directed to your right ear, any kind of verbal input uh, given to the right ear or right visual field have been found to be processed faster. Any kind of judgment that and tasks that are given they are processed faster. Now, in case of bilinguals, if we take this to bilinguals, the question becomes, question turns slightly different, it turn, turns slightly more tricky. Now, we need to find out if there is a hemispheric dominance. So, will right here, right uh, ear and right uh, visual field dominance will be found in case of bilinguals as well. Are the same for L1 and L2 or are there differences? These are the questions that we ask when the same question is asked for bilinguals. So, whether the patterns are same or different between a bilingual and a monolingual with respect to these two things. So, how do we judge all of this? So, this is what we will now see through three different uh, types of tasks or tests that are quite well known in this um, field of study. Uh, the first and foremost is dichotic listening task which takes us to the uh, right ear advantage um, uh, domain, then right visual field advantage studies and dual task paradigm. Dichotic listening task, let us uh, see what that basically is. So, a standard dichotic listening task in typical case uh, whether it is bilingual or monolingual does not really matter. It involves simultaneous presentation of three pairs of spoken digits. Basically, if we break it down to the details, both the ears get simultaneously some kind of auditory input. right? So, simultaneous that is why it is uh, very crucial. Now, through earphone, so a person a subject is made to listen to uh, digits, very different kinds of digits on in two ears or sometimes other things also and the uh, typical task for the participant is to report all digits, that is a very simple task and this needs to be said, this is preferred to be administered to healthy individuals because if you have hearing problems. Uh, in either of the ears, this uh, the person will be unfit for taking this kind of a task. Now, uh, one of the earliest studies by Kimura 1961 found out for the first time that uh, right ear advantage in people, meaning if uh, when simultaneously two uh, different stimuli, auditory stimuli are given to both of the ears, whatever you hear through your right ear will be processed better, as in you are more accurate, less mistakes. Time is uh, time taken is less and so on. So people uh, tell more of the digits presented to the right ear. This is among the first findings in this uh, domain. Later on, uh, 2000, quite uh, quite um, recent uh, in terms of uh, in comparison with Kimura, 2011 study reviews 50 years of research generating out of this dichotic listening task. Uh, this strongly info, uh, underscores the importance of informing about laterality of the brain. Basically meaning that starting from Kimura 1961, there have been plethora of studies looking at the um, laterality measures through using dichotic listening task and it has been taken as one of the most important tasks and that is exactly what um, the 2011 review also suggests that this is a quite a reliable uh, test. Now, the same uh, right ear advantage or 
we uh, in short we call it REA. This was proposed first by Kimura in 61. The same kind of studies have now uh, been used on bilinguals as well. So, many studies have found out that the same kind of variety or advantage uh, exists for bilinguals as well. So, in bilinguals both languages the dominant hemisphere which is the left hemisphere in terms of language left hemisphere is dominant. So, in case of bilinguals also it was found that for both languages of the bilingual the dominant um, hemisphere was responsible for processing meaning there was right ear advantage for both of the languages of the bilingual. So, this is very crucial finding. Some other studies have shown that proficiency also is a variable here. It cannot be taken as a um, you know, blanket statement that for all bilinguals we will see REA. In some cases, in fact, the proficiency of the bilinguals is a very important factor. So, if they are high proficient bilinguals, then we will see the involvement of uh, both, both hemispheres. This is also a very important finding. Another uh, study on uh, dichotic listening task using Portuguese, uh, French bilinguals as well as uh, monolinguals, they did not however find the right ear advantage for these populations. So, basically we see that there are also many other studies we did not include it, but uh, just some representative studies we are talking about here. Roughly the finding is that in case of monolingual population, right ear advantage is a common finding. But in case of bilinguals that finding sometimes is in tune with the earlier findings, but sometimes they do not find the advantage. Sometimes also it becomes a matter of proficiency in the L2 which could be a deciding factor. So, keeping all of these in mind, there have been demands of creating a general uh, set of tasks that are equivalent. Right. So, appropriate level of task difficulty is one very important marker in this case. So, there are two things that are coming out of the research in this domain. One is the proficiency level of the L2 uh, and the task demands. So, different kinds of task demands might have different kinds of results. So, what we need is there, there should be some amount of uh, equivalence across tasks and also equivalence in terms of proficiency. So, in order to get a better idea about uh, what is happening in terms of the uh, dichotic listening task and uh, different brain regions activation, these days dichotic listening task is also uh, done along with some amount of imaging studies, imaging techniques as in brain imaging, various kinds of brain imaging uh, techniques are available these days. So, nowadays we the, the task they use both, both the listening task which is a behavioral task and the uh, brain imaging technique. So, that is one. In terms of visual advantage, right, visual field advantage, these are the tasks that are typically asked in the in the experiments. So, depending on uh, which side of the visual field, uh, typically there will be a computer screen and uh, there, is, there is a fixation cross in the right in the middle and the display appears either on the right side of it or on the left side of it. So, that is how it is um, considered to be part of right visual field or left visual field that is how it is uh, done. So, depending on where on the screen the stimulus is presented we will take, take it as a right visual field uh, presentation versus a left visual field stimulus and these are the kinds of tasks that are given. So, and how the performance on these tasks it will decide whether the uh, which one which uh, visual field has an advantage. So, judging judgment of uh, meaning, uh, distinguishing between words and non-words which is also called lexical decision task. We write it as LDT, lexical decision task. So, lexical decision task is a task where you see a string of letters uh, which may be a word in your language or may not be. So, the distinction between these two and uh, the speed with which words can be read aloud and so many other things. So, various kinds of tasks are given based on the display either in the right visual field or in the left visual field and the results are uh, then taken into account. So, typical findings suggest that there is a right visual field advantage uh, in case of uh, word recognition, visual word recognition. So, LDT and various other tasks are, are done for uh, visual word recognition, various kinds of comprehension tasks. So, this is already understood this is already taken for granted that there exists an right visual field. So, right uh, REA and RVF both are established for monolingual population. 
and sometimes there are also controversies in this sometimes they it is said that the right visual field advantage may not be because of the uh, behavioral laterality of the human brain but because of some other kind of bias for one uh, example there are um, a few studies that have claimed that in english language for example the right visual field advantage is seen because of the way the writing system in this language exists so in english we write from left to right so as a result of which light uh, right visual field probably gets some kind of a biased attentional load so that probably is at the core of why we have right visual field advantage so the, to to look into that issue there was a recent study by hunter and bresbert on attentional bias um, so evidence favoring language dominance over perceptual attention uh, bias has been found out so this is another domain of study similarly there is a uh, dual task paradigm dual task paradigm is also a very important uh, area that has been around for quite some time the primary um, uh, logic of dual task paradigm is if we, we increase the cognitive load if we increase the amount of work to be done if we give two tasks at the same time to the participant how does the participant um, tackle it that is what dual task paradigm is so cognitive asymmetry is basically so cerebral laterality or the cognitive asymmetry in case of bilinguals has been studied using dual task paradigm so dual task paradigm may uh, the participant is given two tasks at the same time some there have been studies uh, comparing monolingual versus bilingual or bilinguals having different levels of proficiency and so on the results again in this also are varied so typically what happens when you have given given two tasks at the same time we need to have a coordination so this uh, as a result of which this coordination will need additional resources additional resources in terms of attention and other capacities so the amount of capacity and resources allocated um, as a result will decrease so basically if you, the amount of attention and the amount of uh, executive uh, control that we will focus on one task uh, if it, the same person does two tasks at the same time the allocation of cognitive resources will be decreasing that is basically the finding so there is a decline in performance when two tasks are given primary finding in these cases is that for bilinguals the cognitive load affects l2 more than l1 so if you ask if you give two tasks at the same time to a bilingual the second language gets affected more as opposed to the first language language task we are, we are talking about language tasks here however dual task paradigm can use uh, different types of task it can be language related it can be non linguistic task as well but if it is a language task l2 gets affected more as we go ahead with various other studies we will see in most of these cases various kinds of task uh, conditions leads the uh, more effect on the l2 as opposed to l1 now there have been a lot of studies over all these years um, from starting from 1960s till today there have been a lot of studies so there we need a meta analysis to look at what is the overall picture it is very difficult to quote each and every study so meta analysis helps so one such well known meta analysis came in 1991 by Veid and Hall and they had a an analysis of 59 laterality studies as in 59 uh, studies or research papers uh, that looked at the laterality issues and um, but then the problem is not all of these laterality studies are uh, uh, based on bilinguals so we have seen that only 11 studies had involved bilinguals and monolinguals and they found no difference among bilinguals versus monolingual lateralization as in the language localization in the brain did not show much difference in terms of behavioral laterality however in some cases there was the variable of age of acquisition of l2 that was considered to be a significant factor so if your l2 acquisition age is much later if we learn the l2 later in life there have been seen some kind of change some kind of differences in the in those cases but overall they did not find much uh, problem so early bilinguals as per the study show evidence of bilateral organization whereas now late bilinguals show left hemispheric lateralization what does this mean if somebody has learned the l2 at an early age the 
language localization will happen in both sides on both both uh, hemispheres. So, the L2 is more globally present if, it, if the language acquisition is early as opposed to late. If we are learning the L2 late in life, then there will be uh, left hemispheric lateralization. So, that is what the finding in 1991 uh, study talked about. A more recent uh, meta-analysis in 2005 that also compared uh, monolinguals with bilinguals and that uh, and they found that bilinguals were less left, left lateralized than monolinguals than monolinguals which is uh, a similar finding as the 91 finding so bilinguals are uh, likely to be more bilaterally organized bilingual and that l2 is more bilaterally present than l1 that is what is so bilinguals are less they are less left lateralized and this is also true of early bilinguals. This is what the earlier finding also talked about. A few couple of years later, another study now looked at 69 um, studies, including including all different kinds of bi behavioral laterality tasks like dichotic listening, like visual field, dual task, all of these uh, major task paradigms. And they looked at the, the comparison was uh, based on two languages or uh, as in L1 and L2, the two they are their two languages and as in L1 versus their L2 or with other bilinguals. So, that, that was the change that this meta analysis looked at compared to the earlier ones. This also, this study also corroborated the earlier finding that age seems to be a very important factor, very important variable and that could decide the localization of the language as opposed to so l1 is that is, uh, as far as l1 is concerned the, there is hardly any controversy l1 is left lateralized as in the left hemisphere houses our first language but l2 might be there might be lot of variation across population depending on where in the brain l2 is localized it can be in in both the hemispheres it can be in one single hemisphere uh, the reason of this variability is one reason is age so the age of acquisition Age of acquisition is um, uh, written like this in in the, in our in the literature in in this literature we write like this AOA A capital O small A capital again. So uh, as we just said that age age seems to be an in, important predictor. However, these studies are of a particular type. So there are not too many uh, types of bilinguals that are represented not too many L2s are represented and so on. So, one of the um, suggestions in this regard uh, that has been that, that has come out is that more non-English um, speakers should be taken into account. So, English either an L2 or an L1 uh, is of course a very important source of data, but more different kinds of populations need to be studied. More early bilinguals also need to be uh, represented in the data and so on. So, uh, other, other domains that need to be looked at as per the uh, suggestions of most many researchers is that typically we have used um, uh, single words uh, in, the, in this kind of judgment task. So, there should be uh, every level of language should be represented. So, word level is a very um, at, a, at a very rudimentary level. So, why not look at the sentence level and beyond as well. So, paragraphs, how do you process paragraphs and so on. So, another important as neuroscience has taken uh, giant leaps in the last couple of decades another another important question that has been asked is why look at a bigger picture of lateralization only why not look at distinct possibilities within each hemisphere that that suggestion has also uh, come up so neural activation within each hemisphere not only we should look at different kinds of bilingual population non english included now we also should look at early bilinguals we should we need more data on early bilinguals from across a different kinds of diverse backgrounds thirdly we need more and more input of language uh, types of language use beyond single word and last but not the least neural activation within each hemisphere also should be a matter of concern it's not a, um, there should there could be differences even at that level so, these are the things that are in there in terms of behavioral laterality studies and things where, uh, where they stand today. Another important domain um, of uh, study with respect to uh, organization of the two languages in the brain of a bilingual is uh, has come from the aphasia uh, data. 
data from aphasia and um, epileptic patients. In fact, aphasia is, uh, is a language disorder as many of you might be knowing and electrophysiological data also have, have come from another type of patients, epilepsy patients. Okay, so, a lot of this uh, data have come from epileptic patients or two kinds of patients data have informed us about how the bilingual two languages could be organized in the brain. So, this data is uh, not any task data, but simply patients data. Now, aphasia as many of you might already be knowing, aphasia are a kind of a language disorder. There are two kinds of um, aphasia, one is called acquired, another is developmental. Developmental language disorders can be of two types, developmental and acquired. Aphasia is one of the acquired language disorders, right? So, aphasia occurs when the for various reasons, one there could be a brain injury, there could be a stroke, there could be you know hemorrhage and various kinds of things that uh, lead to aphasia. So, damage to the uh, those part of the brain that are responsible for language functions results in aphasia. Aphasia are of uh, two types, three types. Um, in fact, now there are many other types of types also, but primarily when you talk about aphasia, uh, we talk about Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia and global aphasia. So, this part is just for you to um, all of you to brush up the what is what kind of aphasia exist and what part of brain uh, is responsible, where do we need the uh, problem to happen in order to in order for us to have Broca's aphasia. So, this is the Broca's area in the brain. So, any kind of damage to this particular brain area will lead to Broca's aphasia. Similarly, Wernicke's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia is also called the fluent aphasia as opposed to Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia is non-fluent aphasia because in this aphasia, there is a lot of uh, difficulty in speaking. Production gets heavily disturbed. In case of Wernicke's aphasia, however, production is not disturbed, but understanding is disturbed. So, uh, semantics um, uh, will be absent. So, this is the Wernicke's area. Any kind of damage to this particular brain region leads to Wernicke's area. Similarly, there is a global aphasia. Now, this is uh, this is the most severe type of aphasia. Uh, this, this typically happens as a result of injuries in the left hemisphere of the brain. But the injury needs to uh, more widespread than either Broca's or Wernicke's aphasia. So, in this case, there will be uh, severe. So, they can only produce a very few words. So, production is affected or can understand very little. So, this is sort of a combination of Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia. They can speak very little, they can understand very little also. So, this is what uh, uh, aphasia is all about. So, this is just a, a representative map for you to. Uh, remember what uh, which are the brain areas are responsible. Now, in terms of aphasia uh, and bilingualism, there have been some reports. There are, but the number of bilinguals, uh, by the data of bilingual aphasics is far less as opposed to monolingual aphasics. But nonetheless, there exists some data, and based on that data, we will see what it talk, what it says about bilinguals. So, the primary question about aphasia patients in bilinguals or bilingual aphasics is that how the two languages might be affected. Do they get affected similarly or do they get affected differently? That is the question uh, that, that have been asked. So, in some cases, uh, there is a lot of uh, variability in this uh, fine in the data in this domain and um, some such, such people often such people exhibit a comparable degree of uh, impairment meaning that uh, bi bilinguals both languages could be affected similarly. And if they are affected similarly, the recovery also is similar. That is that is uh, one side of the finding, but some other cases also show there are different patterns. So, both languages uh, do not get affected in the same way. So, two kinds of findings have been reported in the literature. Uh, one one uh, group say that there are similar kind of the problems and similar recovery pattern. The others other findings suggest that they are are differences and uh, those differences lead to various kinds of patterns that is not sing, not, not a, a single pattern and uh, so we need to look at all these different types of patterns right so uh, when there are differences these are the kind of differences that um, uh, paradis uh, collected and put them together 
So one is called the selective aphasia. In case of selective aphasia, patients only one language is in, uh, impaired. So a bilingual speaking L1 and L2, let's say only the L1 gets affected or only the L2 gets affected. That is selective aphasia. Differential aphasia is both languages get affected, but there are different degrees of impairment. So a one language getting affected more compared to the other. Successive aphasia has also been reported in the literature where one language gets affected first and then the other language gets affected. So you lose um, capacity to speak in L1 first uh, or, or L2 first and then the other one follows that is another. Antagonistic aphasia has also been reported. This is um, a rather uh, different type where recovery of one progresses while recovery of the other regresses. So as one gets better, the other language gets worse. That has also been. So there is an opposite pattern between L1 and L2 in terms of recovery. Then there is um, um, uh, alternating uh, antagonism also. So availability shifts between language. Sometimes this language is available, sometimes the other one. And blending or mixing. So properties of multiple languages are mixed. So one property of this language gets attached to another property of another language and so on. So it inflections could be of one language could be uh, used for and to with a root word of another and so on. So various patterns uh, do exist. So uh, there are um, findings from differential impairment hints at language acquisition history as a possible mediator. So there when, when there are differences, in many cases there are no differences, when there are differences there are this kind of different patterns and one possible reason for these different patterns is um, that has been put forward is the language acquisition history as in when in at what age the second language was acquired and because that is that is uh, taken as a very important predictor of the neural organization if you uh, just as we have seen the, uh, with the studies with uh, behavioral laterality that early bilinguals show a very different pattern of lateralization as opposed to late bilinguals. Similar kind of uh, thesis have been proposed for uh, aphasic data as well. Uh, another old study 1959 study had um, proposed that they had found that the bilinguals who had acquired their two language in similar context tended to show similar kind of deficit, parallel deficit. So if for example, if we go back to our uh, simultaneous bilingualism, so if a simultaneous bilingual is affected by uh, aphasia, chances are higher that both of his languages will be equally affected or parallelly affected. That is what they mean that the similar context, learning the languages in similar context may lead to similar patterns of deficit. And then those who learn the language in different stages tended to show different impairment. There are various kinds of theories that have been given. However, a recent um, comparatively recent study uh, by Franco Fabro in 2001 has uh, severely criticized such findings and, and uh, cast a lot of doubt. Uh, there, has, there are many reasons that he has said that the data probably has some uh, issues. A uh, couple of reasons he has put forward, one of them is publication bias. Publication bias is uh, a bias that exists for publishing certain kind of result and ignoring the other kind of results. So he says that publication bias has worked here uh, in order to highlight the differences and also selected cases. So the subjects, so the studies that were selected, like there was not a, it was not a random general study. So for example, an uh, unselected group study by him, by uh, his uh, group found that parallel language impairment represented 65 percent of the case. So, his study which shows that uh, in 65 percent that is majority of the cases parallel impairment um, happens. In any case, um, since we have the data for bo both parallel and non-parallel uh, impairment, there have been various study, various theories that have been put forward uh, as to understand, to answer, to justify as to what probably is the reason. These four are most uh, important um, uh, theoretical standpoint to try and understand what is happening. So one is called the rule of Ribot. So Ribot is uh, well known for his study on uh, retrograde amnesia. So in case of amnesia, he found out that uh, not all kinds of memory are lost. Certain memories that have been uh, created earlier, some skills that were that you have learnt earlier are more difficult to 
lose and the skills that are learned uh, later so that they are easily lost. So, um, the earlier memories or skills uh, they, they are more likely to remain intact. So, this is uh, this his theory was with respect to memory in, in terms of amnesia. So, taking that theory to language in case of language disorder the idea is that if the language that you have learned first um, in, in the first part of your life will remain intact, it will get less affected by uh, aphasia as opposed to a language that is learned later. So, again age becomes age of acquisition becomes a very important um, uh, marker, a very important variable to uh, make sense of what is happening. So, this is about uh, rule of Ribot to understand polyglot aphasia, polyglot aphasia that affects uh, bilinguals or multilinguals. Another important uh, rule so that have also been uh, proposed is called Pitre's rule. Now, he, this rule says that it is not so much about the age of acquisition of the second language, but however, how well it was used. So, are you using your L2 uh, sporadically or do you use your L2 most of the time that, that will decide how much it will get affected. So, language that was used most prior to aphasia would be most resistant to impairment. This is what the, um, the this rule says. So, as opposed to Ribot, Ribo said Ribot's idea takes age of acquisition as an important factor, Pitre's rule takes the use factor, usage of the language as an important factor as a resistance to aphasia. Third principle was uh, put forward by Minkowski gives more importance to emotional significance of the language. This theory actually goes back a long time. Um, this, uh, in fact, at, there was a time when we, uh, the differentiation between L1 and L2 was that L1 is the language of emotion. L1 is, uh, uh, you know, when you really uh, you need to use a language for emotional purposes, this is L1 is what. So, this is basically the uh, emotional valence of language that Mil Minkowski talks about. So, the language that is more connected to emotion is the one that is more resistant to uh, being lost uh, due to aphasia. And then uh, we also have Luria, uh, Luria's uh, theory is more dependent on the mode of acquisition of the language rather than age or you know, usage or emotion. He says that most important thing is which is the mode in through which the language was learned, was it visual mode or was it auditory mode. What he basically means is that often what happens in the in childhood, the first language is learned not so much through teaching or through using books or uh, some such other things, but more more in the uh, social domain by listening to other people. So, that is dependent on the auditory vocal loop. On the other hand, often the second language is learned through visual mode. So, using books and various visual mediums. So, that is exactly what he, he brings to focus. He said if the uh, visual cortex gets affected uh, because of the stroke or the head injury, then the language that was based on visual input will be lost as opposed to the other, other kind of thing. So, there are these kind of uh, four main theories that have been put forward to uh, in order to understand how the uh, how aphasia of any kind may affect L1 versus L2 that is our aphasia data. But the problem here is that because the data is so varied, there is so much of difference across uh, studies, across population that very difficult to uh, really come to a conclusion as to uh, what has, uh, what really has happened. Uh, there are many, uh, many factors as in when the uh, there is a patient which suffering from aphasia, by the time that person goes to, goes for medical uh, intervention, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, tasks that the person is put through. Many, many kinds of linguistic tasks also to see what kind of language function has been uh, affected. Now, one important aspect in this profiling of the patient is knowing about the language competence of the person before the uh, problem happened, before he became an aphasic patient. So, that also is also a very crucial um, uh, data source. Now, this data of course is collected either from the patient or from the patient's family members, other close associates and so on. So, this uh, this data is often they, they need to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, nobody, no family member will say his L2 performance was uh, not very good before. They, it is it's not a, uh, to put it very bluntly, the data is not often very reliable. 
Another uh, problem that many researchers have been talking about is lack of systematic assessment of the patients all languages. So, that there needs to be a very uh, thorough analysis of the patient's impairment in all the languages that he knows and uh, because this kind of standardized test batteries came much later, the earlier studies have been that is why cast in doubt. So, this um, in fact, uh, this is this came in as late as 87, Paradis is credited with creating the bilingual, bilingual aphasia test which is used now for, uh, for assessment of uh, a bilinguals both languages or a multilinguals all the languages. So, the data before this hence has some issues. So, as a result not much of consensus as to how to interpret the data because of the uh, varied uh, possibilities. However, we must keep in mind that both possibilities exist that bilinguals L2 may be affected just, just as the L1 does or there might be differences. Another set of data that we have in terms of um, uh, bilingual uh, the laterality, the bilingual second language um, uh, organization in the brain, that data comes from electrocortical stimulation mapping. Now, this is uh, basically a, sim a test that is done before epileptic surgery. Before we go there, let us uh, just uh, to give you a brief idea about the different kinds of brain mapping methods which are not in which are direct methods. So, there are different kinds of um, machines that are used for collecting information about the neural activity uh, using different kinds of. So, there could be you know outside the brain, there could be so, so intracranial versus uh, outside extracranial kind of mapping. So, electrophysiology is basically what. So, direct electrical stimulation is one such method that uses uh, direct electrical stimulation of the open head, open head as in the cortex. So, this was first um, performed by Wilder Penfield he, in the late 19th century, it really goes back a, a lot of time. So, uh, what happened is this the history goes back to basically the treatment of epilepsy. When all uh, when the epileptic person needs to get a surgery done in order to uh, for his as a, as a treatment to get rid of the seizures, typical procedure involves a uh, opening up the head, opening up the uh, the skull in that region, the epileptic region of the brain, and then a, a small electrode is uh, connected to the uh, surface of the of the brain, and mild very mild minute amount of uh, current is passed through. In order to check which, uh, because uh, epileptic surgery includes removing brain parts surgically. So, certain part of the brain will be removed in order to help the patient. So, in that case, uh, while removing those areas, it is always taken in taken care of that the regions responsible for other functions should not get affected. Other functions include language function. So, that is exactly why this task is done. So, direct electrical stimulation is typically a part of epileptic surgery to check for language areas in the brain. So, this is the history of course goes back one you can uh, read up just this will give you a brief idea about how the field came to being. So, there were lots of studies um, after Penfield lots of other uh, people also studied and basically the outcome of these studies was in the initial days it was to know uh, the brain areas for language functions. So, which part of the brain is responsible for processing what language. So, often there was no focus on bilinguals or monolinguals or anything, patients do not come in that kind of uh, format. So, typical findings would be there will be more monolinguals than bilinguals, the data is uh, such. So, basically the basic findings were um, that there are few discrete sites in the brain that are responsible for naming and so on. And also there were lots of individual differences uh, that was found out during this kind of studies. This is how the open brain looks and so on. So, these are various types of um, uh, brain imaging techniques. Now, if, what does the evidence from direct electrical stimulation of epileptic patients uh, tell us that there are lots of um, different, brain, different brain regions we, we come to know about and uh, there are a lot of data. Uh, in one study, they talked, uh, they, they have uh, mentioned 350 patients data, but the thing is that that entire data set only had a very few uh, bilinguals. So, in, uh, in case of bilinguals, however, the data is because it is the data is less, so the picture is not very clear. 
uh, and the studies are also con not conducted very systematically as we have mentioned in the previous task this epileptic surgeries have been going on for a very long time going back to late 19th century however the test batteries were created only uh, towards the end of 20th century so the large amount of data that are presented that are mentioned that are, that exist in the literature are uh, they don't have that systematic test batteries used right so it, a lot of uh, subjectivity could probably creep in so and, and another thing is the data does not uh, have too many bilingual patients mentioned there are also other um, issues that have been mentioned by uh, various researchers that tests need to be done for both of the languages of the patients which often were not used but uh, nonetheless there have been some systematic studies on bilingual patients with uh, uh, in this kind of studies so one of them was the 1978 study uh, by Whitaker and his group on, on two patients and by another group in on a small number of patients because there are not too many bilingual patients in this uh, domain that have been reported so this uh, these studies uh, this later studies they reported some partially distinct and some cases partially overlapping areas for the bilinguals two languages. So the monolinguals uh, data we already know which are the areas in the brain that are responsible for language. However, there are lots of differences across patients. In case of uh, bilingual the findings the later systematic studies reveal that there are uh, some cases they have found overlapping areas, some cases they have found distinct areas. What does this basically mean? that um, in some cases the L1 and L2 were found to be uh, placed in distinct areas in the brain but in some cases uh, there were overlaps. So in the same area you could find both L1 and L2. In, in terms of the experiments what this basically means is that the electrical stimulation of certain cortical regions selectively disrupted naming typically they will have the naming of words naming uh, the then digit naming and so on. So in some cases if the, there was an electric um, current passed, so only naming in only one language got affected but not in the other, other language which means there are distinct areas for naming in both languages, right. While in other cases while, while stimulation in some other parts showed that both languages were affected uh, while they were trying to name. However, again particular location for disruption was found to be different for uh, different participants. So basically across participants there is a lot of diverse uh, findings. So, there is lot of variability across patients. Another um, in, a, in a small number of patients they also found a wider area of disruption for the less proficient language meaning the less proficient language was much more widely represented as opposed to the more proficient language. This takes us back to the older finding that L2 is globally present, L1 is present only in the left. Uh, hemisphere. So, this is also similar uh, finding. Some recent studies also have uh, these are comparatively recent 2002 and 4 that distinct cortical modules exist for different languages and also electrical stimulation to specific areas are found to be responsible for errors either in L1 or L2. So, there are distinct areas that I have been talking about. So, a lot of studies the gist of the matter is that a lot of studies have found out distinct cortical regions that are devoted to either L1 or L2. However, there are also some findings that do talk about overlapping areas, but largely the finding is that L2 is globally represented versus L1 which is uh, left um, lateralized, right? As a result of which possibility exists that L2 and L1 will have a different uh, sort of representation. Now, this kind of studies also come with their own limitations. There are quite a few questions that have been raised. One is that uh, this electrical stimulation study is never carried out a normal population. Nobody is not a fun thing. It is used only with epileptic patients. Now, with epileptic patients also this is a very tiny area of the brain that is uh, exposed where this entire uh, experimentation goes on then how can this be taken as uh, a representative sample for everybody that is the question that have been asked. So because this is only the surface or uh, that to a very small area of the surface that is uh, checked in fact the gyrus of the cortex that is the top part of the cortex not the lower part 
that that gets uh, studied. So, the, this is very limited in scope in terms of giving us the full picture because it is not only the gyrus but also the sulcus and various subcortical regions which are also responsible for language function be it L1 or L2. So, that is one problem with this kind of studies. Uh, similarly, there is this um, the other uh, factor that has been pointed out is that epileptic surgery takes place only when the per patient has been suffering for years. So, it, it, it is not a first uh, level of treatment, this is the last level of treatment which means the, uh, this person has been uh, unwell for a very long time. So, what if the long, long uh, period of um, uh, illness has already reorganized the cortical uh, areas, already reorganized the neuronal organization, how, how, what about the neuronal organization and getting reorganized because of the illness that is also uh, a possibility. And then also the, because the data come from uh, patients, namely the epileptic patients, there is always some, you know, if uh, the, about using this data on normal population. So, data from patients and uh, extrapolating that data to normal population has always been a tricky affair, whether it is aphasics or it is epileptic patients. Nonetheless, they are important source of data for us to take the field uh, ahead. However, this kind of limitations do exist. Another domain of studies that have informed bilingual language organization in the brain is what is called the WADA test or this is also called split brain studies. In, what, uh, in this study what happens is that uh, the primary uh, idea is to check the functioning of each hemisphere alone. So, uh, you know individually if we can you look at uh, only the working of the left hemisphere whether the right hemisphere is not active something of that sort. So, that to do that of course, that is uh, if, if the corpus callosum is cut in some way then that will happen, but artificially in the in laboratory setup this has been also done uh, by using what is called the water test. So, what happens in water test this is also called sodium amytal test. Sodium amytal is a chemical, it is uh, called truth serum uh, for I do not know which reason and this is actually a sedative, a hyp hypnotic sedative. Now, this study involves injecting this particular chemical in the carotid artery. Now, carotid artery as we uh, as all of us know carries blood, this is the main source of blood flow to the brain. So, we have the two carotid arteries taking blood to the two parts of the two sides of the brain, so right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. So, if you inject sodium amytal in the right uh, carotid artery, the right brain sleeps if you do it to the left uh, carotid artery, the left brain sleeps. Now, using this there have been some studies that looked into the organization of L1 versus L2 in the human brain. Uh, so, one, uh, one hemisphere is put to sleep by using this and then certain kinds of linguistic tasks are given to the person. Uh, this is not harmful, the person does not really suffer, then this, this lasts for a very short time. So, that disclaimer is important. So, uh, while one brain sleep, one part of the brain sleeps, the person is put uh, asked to carry out certain tasks in language in both L1 and L2. So, the ones the first they will put the left hemisphere to sleep and some task and then right hemisphere and then some task and so on. So, typical findings have found out that when the left brain sleeps, the language functions decline. When the left brain brain is put to uh, you know when the left brain is inactive, the language functions are and then the people gradually become in a, unable to speak. But when right hemisphere is put to sleep, this this thing does not happen. So, this this kind of findings uh, are they have been reported from 1970s and 80s. Now, in case of bilinguals, this study this kind of task have been carried out for bilinguals also and they show that um, in a particular study in by Gomez uh, 1995, they show complete speech arrest in left sided vada test. So, when the left hemisphere is put to sleep, when the left hemisphere is inactive, people the participants stopped talking altogether. There was no complete speech arrest. This is called sp complete speech arrest. The person sp stops speaking altogether. Later, this, this person, this particular patient had undergone a blood vessel lesion surgery and later on showed signs of deficit only in his uh, native language. After, after the surgery when uh, there was uh, some amount of uh, probably some removal of brain areas in the brain parts in this in this study in this uh, surgery and then they, he showed deficits only in his native language which is L1. 
Another study in 1990 reported recovery of L2 after L1 um, after left sided WADA test but not after right sided test. So basically there are different kinds of findings uh, but in these two studies they have showed that uh, left hemisphere is responsible for so the dominant hemisphere is responsible for both L1 and L2. There are some other studies who have found uh, that L2 is more globally present using WADA test as well. Uh, however, there are differences as we said uh, already we have seen that there are these differences across uh, population. Now basically often this uh, in this kind of studies they have initial cases they, they have used patients and patients uh, you cannot choose um, the, the, have to have them as bilingual or high proficient bilingual versus low proficient bilingual so those parameters cannot be checked. But the data that exists there, there is some amount of variability. So, in, uh, uh, in terms of which brain region, dominant finding is left hemispheric lateralization for both languages. So, on the basis of data from all of these uh, studies, different studies, uh, we can safely say that there are possibilities that have been uh, indicated by whether it is behavioral laterality task, WADA task or in different kinds of uh, various other kinds of tasks that there exists a possibility that L1 and L2 are differently represented in the brain and there could also be some overlapping regions. So, to take, uh, take care of these there are many parameters what might be the reason for uh, differences when they exist and what are the areas where we find uh, overlapping. So, this needs further study and further study with uh, respect to normal uh, typical population not patient data. So, this, this is um, th this kind of historical background tells us that these are the uh, things that need to be taken into account. And the deciding factors are also seem to be the age of acquisition, proficiency in L1 versus L2 and many other control measures like proficiency uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, executive functions and attentional allocation, cognitive load and so on. So, there are many factors that are now being looked at and taking care of all of these accounts there are uh, uh, the Hernandez 2013 and Costa 2020 have taken into or taken all of this into account and have given a complete very comprehensive uh, analysis and account of the bilingual brain and that is what we will discuss in the uh, next segment. But as of now the older data suggests that there are a possibility there are uh, possibilities of uh, variability across language uh, uh, L1 and L2 in terms of the bilingual brain uh, in terms of various task conditions. Now uh, we will look at the uh, uh, picture as it stands today in the next segment. Thank you. Mm -hmm.